Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Governor John Carney. Thank you for joining us uh, for our weekly press conference on Delaware's response to COVID-19. We appreciate uh, you tuning in. Uh, today, I'm joined again by the Director of the Division of Public Health, Dr. Carol Rattay. And Dr. Rattay, thank you for being with us again and for the tre tremendous work that your team is doing. Uh, and we're also joined by A.J. Shaw, who's uh, the Director of the Del Delaware Emergency Management Agency. AJ, thank you for being with us again as well, and, and your work, particularly your work in testing. We've meet, uh, met uh, New Heights uh, with respect to testing across Delaware, and uh, very, very impressive. We'll get to that in a bit. I've been saying for several weeks now uh, that uh, the number of positive cases and the presence of COVID-19 virus in our state has been increasing uh, and increasing at, at an alarming rate and that we were looking at uh, mechanisms, uh, restrictions that we might uh, need to put in place uh, in order to, to stem that tide, to, to flatten that curve uh, once again, uh, as we did uh, back earlier this year. We've been doing this now since March. Uh, the first positive case was identified on March the 11th with various uh, shutdowns at stayed home orders and restrictions on business operations and the rationale, the public health rationale around all of that is that you have to limit uh, the exposure of individuals to those who are shedding the virus and, there, and thereby uh, reduce the presence of the virus in the community. Otherwise, it uh, tra uh, transmits and, and uh, gets worse uh, exponentially uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so that you have to take often dramatic action to do that, uh, to squash that uh, spread. To give you an idea of, of kind of where we are today, uh, before we get into the data dashboard, if you think back uh, in August uh, when I was complaining about being put on quarantine li lists in New York and New Jersey uh, and Connecticut and Pennsylvania and in Washington, D.C., our new positive cases uh, then was in the, were in the 90 to 100 range. Uh, and if you remember, if we had a seven day moving average above 97, I think it was, we would be on the quarantine list uh, in those states. Uh, today, the seven day moving average uh, is 326 uh, with a daily number of 395 yesterday, I should say, uh, which means that the number of new positive cases uh, has uh, tripled or quad quadrupled, depending uh, on what, uh, what number you use. And we'll have a slide later where we talk about hospitalizations, which is a number that we look very closely at. We hit a peak uh, back in April at 337. Uh, today's number is uh, 153. Again, we'll walk through all this. And so the conditions on the ground are uh, getting worse and we need to take action uh, targeted towards the venues where spread is occurring, uh, which we know through the contact tracing effort that we have had for some time now. Uh, states have learned a lot over the last nine months in terms of uh, the nature of the virus, how it spreads, where it spreads, and what you can do to contain it. We all know now uh, that fa mask wearing is probably the most important thing that can be done, it can cut down by over 70% the, the risk of, of spreading under certain conditions. We know that social distancing work works. We know that uh, appropriate hygiene, uh, washing of the hands, uh, and washing down surfaces works as well. We also know that keeping pe people separate from one another that are shedding the virus uh, is the objective of all of that. And it's in some ways common sense. The more people that you have with the virus testing positive, the more, the, the, the more likelihood the potential of them coming into contact with somebody who's not positive and therefore spreading the virus to them. And then it becomes an exponential function as it, as it grows and increases. And so we need to push down and limit the exposures of those folks that are tested positive, and we may not know where they are. Most likely we do not. There are lots of folks that are asymptomatic 
uh, that are shedding the virus. And so the actions that we're taking today are, are ones that I'd rather we not have to, to take. Uh, as I've been saying for the last uh, uh, two or three weeks, um, we have objectives to increase economic activity uh, and business uh, operations as well as improving the health of the community and that you have to have both. And so what we're doing today is an attempt to strike a balance there to target the restrictions on venues where we know uh, transmission occurs. So let's go look at the, the data dashboard. Again, we're closing in on 30,000 uh, total cases. Again, sadly, 739 uh, fatalities. Hospitalizations, I mentioned, that number is increasing at 153. The low point uh, was midsummer at about in the mid 40s. And, you, and we'll see a slide in a few minutes that, that shows the, uh, th the fact that this is a lagging indicator uh, that starts with new positive uh, cases, goes to hospitalizations, and then to fatalities. If you look at the distribution again, Newcastle County, 16,000 positive cases. Kent County, uh, 4,100. Uh, Sussex County, where the highest transmission rate, the highest uh, rate uh, is in Sussex County with 91, almost 9,200. So let's look at uh, part of this is a function of testing, and, and AJ's team doing a great job. Our goal was to have 80,000 tests a month. I think in October we were well over 100,000 tests per month, so you're going to get more positives as, as a result of that. A measure of that uh, relative uh, to any other time period is the percent of those tests that are positive. And so look, let's look at those numbers. If you think about just the per persons that were tested positive, because people get tested more than once, we're up to 14% of the persons who've been tested or are testing positive on a say, seven day moving average, but only 5.5% of the actual tests. And we'll show you that in a minute, how many people have been tested, persons have been tested in Delaware, and how many tests have been administered. So the new cases per today is 347, the seven day moving average. Again, think back of where we were in August, we're in the 97, 90 to 100 range and trying to be under 97, so we were off the quarantine list. So you're, you can see we're several times that, which means that there are that many times the potential exposures in the public for transmitting the virus further. So here's the, what I was just mentioned a minute ago. So we've had almost 400,000 Delawareans, closing in on half of our population of 970,000, persons who've been tested at least once. Once they get tested again, it won't go into this calculation, the percent positive of persons tested. The number on the other side, 634,000, is the total tests that have been administered. So the more appropriate calculation of the per, uh, percent positive. But again, you can see that many people have been tested more than once, and that's a really good thing. I think I've been tested now four times, something like that. And I know others, particularly uh, teachers, first responders, healthcare workers, essential workers have been tested many a times. We're trying to test uh, teachers and educators at least once a month now that they've uh, gone back to in-person instruction. So those numbers will continue to increase. Here's the breakdown demographics. Still the young adult population with the highest. You can see all the uh, lines are starting to spike upward. Uh, to, re to reflect the current uptick in cases. If you look at the 14-day view of this, the top two are your current hospitalizations, a uh, very bad trend uh, in current hospitalizations up, little data glitch there with the one bar that's below the, quite a bit below the line, uh, nothing to be concerned about or that's relevant. It uh, caught up in the next, the next day. So we're up to 153 there. New hospitalizations looks better. It's going down. Uh, that should hopefully bode well. We'll see. And then the other concerning uh, criteria, new positive cases, the orange line is the day-to-day -day ups and downs just because we're doing so many tests or getting so many test results in batches back with the seven-day moving average reflected by 
the blue bar, which is consistently going up, obviously in the wrong direction, and which drives us to, to uh, propose uh, to put in place the, the restrictions that we're going to talk about in a minute. So the two measures of percent of positive, uh, the bottom left is the percent of positive, so it's going to be a bigger number because it doesn't include people who have been toast tested more than once. So that's 14 percent. And then uh, the seven-day moving average on the percentage of tests that are positive is 5.5 percent seven-day moving average. We want that to be below five. And so we're, we... Uh, we're not as bad as, as we could be there, and a lot of that is because of the considerable testing that we're doing. If you see the 90-day view, I won't go through each of the graphs, but you can just see things trending upward in terms of hospitalizations, new positive cases, the percent positive, not as dramatically uh, when you look under the test positive, uh, but clearly in the wrong direction, and we need to get ahead of it, particularly on the hospitalization side. Uh, the personal protective equipment, data dashboards, all those vessels are full, so we're in pretty good shape there. Uh, let's look at the current hospitalization numbers. If you go back to the spring, on April the 6th, we had 140 hospitalizations. Remember, lagging indicator, by April the 17th, we peaked at 337. On June the 3rd, on the way down, we were at 142. We hit a low over the summer. In the mid-40s, I think 44 was, was the low sometime in, I want to say, July or August. And then September, we've been ticking up, where today we're at uh, 153. And we don't want to go from 153 to 353. And recognizing that this is a lagging indicator with the positive cases going in the direction that the are, they are, uh, that's could be the trend that we're on, and we don't want to be on that trend. Hospitals now are, are doing elective surgeries. Back in the spring when we hit the, that peak, uh, they were had suspended most elective surgeries, and so they had additional capacity. We estimate that the total critical care capacity statewide of hospitals is in the 400 to 450 range, depending on the day, AJ. Uh, we do, do keep track of those numbers and, and we'll continue to do so. And so we're clearly seeing a surge, uh, the, and we're seeing the surge in cases occurring in areas um, that we know of in gatherings, large gatherings, both indoors, not as much outdoors, uh, but certainly indoors with others who are not in the same household. So bringing in folks that might be living in different environments, exposing one group to another, and then spreading the virus. It only takes one person to be positive for that exposure to result in a transmission. And that's kind of the point, the logic behind a restriction movement, and that is to try to minimize uh, the exposure that one person, one group has with another uh, because that person may or may not uh, have a uh, COVID-19. So let's take a look at the specific restriction, restrictions. Uh, we talked about indoor gatherings. A lot of, uh, of this transmission is happening in, frankly, um, social environments, parties, dinners, having the guys over to watch the football game and some beers inside. Uh, we have a limit now that's consistent with the outdoor limit, which is uh, 250, I believe, totally unrealistic under the current condition, and we're uh, imposing a new restriction on, on 10. Essentially, uh, the, uh, the household the family there um, discouraging uh, gatherings more than that for the time being. We know we're coming into Thanksgiving, the implications of that, but we also know we want to not uh, restrict the uh, places of business, particularly hospitality and restaurants, for any longer period of time than, than need be, uh, and obviously to keep our children in school and get more children back in school. Indoor gatherings outside of the home, which include kind of events, weddings, worship services, performances, political gatherings, events in public spaces, including fire halls, uh, 
the limit would be 30% of fire capacity and whatever that facility is up to a limit of 50 people. And so with some of the larger venues, we felt like we needed to discourage, to, to not discourage, but to restrict a gatherings of, of more than 50 people. At to, outdoor gatherings, similarly with a tighter restriction than two, 250 with a plan, but now 50 people or as much as 250 with a plan approved by DPH, so a maximum of 250 uh, people. There are some gatherings uh, that have are working under uh, already approved uh, public health plans that, that will be, uh, like football games co come to mind, will be able to operate under that basis. The restriction that is most difficult uh, for me, particularly given uh, our ongoing conversations with the bars and restaurants to do things and do things in a, a safe uh, way, is to reduce their, their indoor uh, operating uh, capacity to th from 60% to 30% of the fire capacity indoors with allowance for outdoor dining. Now recognizing that we're moving into the colder months um, and that, that that has implications for how, m how many people would be willing to dine out, uh, outdoors. Um, I do, do know I had a, a gathering informal in-home gathering the, the other night uh, at my sister's house and we all got together and ate outdoors. We had a, a fire pit there and it was a little chilly but certainly safer with my 89-year-old mother there than uh, doing it in, inside. Uh, currently, we require mask wearing in restaurants until the point of people being seated uh, because they obviously have to eat. Now we're going to require that there be table signs that ask diners to keep a mask on until they're ready to eat. I mean, that's the difference between restaurants and other indoor uh, locations. Um, and that is because you take your mask off while you're eating, obviously. Uh, but you don't have to do that in other indoor venues. And so there's a distinction there that's a really important one. Because one of the things that, that we know is that masks are critically important and effective in preventing the spread of the virus. And turns out, not just earlier on, it, the, the idea was that it was mostly to protect others from respiratory particles coming from the mask wearer. But increasingly, there's evidence that it helps the other way around too and protect, protects the mask wearer from a respiratory particles that might be coming from somebody else. What we know is definitively is that mask wearing makes a difference and makes a huge difference. And that's why it shouldn't become a political issue. These restrictions here will become effective on next Monday, the 23rd, as will be the ones that I, I talked about with gatherings uh, on the slide before. Lastly, uh, not lastly, we've also seen uh, spread identified in gyms and exercise facilities. And right now, uh, there are mask requirements for um, these exercise facilities, but they don't include aerobic exercises like treadmills and stationary bikes uh, and the like. And at least in the YMCA that I go to, most people abide by those, um, everybody does, or they don't let you, you know, exercise. Uh, but the, the current uh, use of, of face coverings for those that are on the treadmills and, and the bikes and the right is spotty at best uh, because it's not required, number one. And so we're adding this requirement uh, there. I do it myself, I know it can be done and it can be done uh, safely. Uh, the last thing that we have in terms of restrictions, we've seen really uh, bad situations and um, transmission with sports tournaments. And um, I, I got a, an email from a constituent uh, just the other day who's a school nurse and said that uh, at one of the private schools actually over the line in, in Maryland 
that uh, she had lots of children that were quarantining uh, because they had participated in a particular sports tournament out of state and that now those tournaments were going to be moved to Delaware because they didn't have uh, a similar restriction. Uh, we've seen behavior outside of this sporting event itself with folks, with parents and spectators that really is concerning and so we're restricting uh, and limiting no out-of-state sports tournaments. If, if uh, sports teams want to have in-state uh, tournaments, uh, they can do that. If they want to have in-state games, one team against another, uh, they can do that as well. This restriction will take effect on Tuesday, December the 1st. I mentioned how difficult it is uh, for me with respect to the restrictions on restaurants and, and hospitality based on what we've seen, based on the sacrifices that uh, those business owners already have made uh, based on the importance uh, that they have to our communities and, and the enjoyable side of life. We have to try to take blunt some of the economic impact here. We'll expand our Delaware relief grants by up to $25 million to enable those businesses who've already qualified and they've gotten uh, a relief grant as a restaurant to double the original grant amount. So if they got $100,000 in the first uh, iteration of this, now they'll be eligible almost automatically for another $100,000 to enable them uh, to get to the other side. There are certain businesses that didn't apply or maybe didn't qualify uh, for their first round, uh, they can uh, apply with the deadline of December the 4th because remembering these are federal funds that have to be expended by the end of the year. So $25 million to double the amount uh, of restaurants and, and these hospitality businesses received from the CARES relief grants first uh, in the first phase and now another phase that would, would uh, enable them to double that amount. You know, part of uh, the teachers have done and educators have done a really extraordinary job uh, in continuing to provide remote instruction, to provide in-person in instruction, to follow all the restrictions, to do all the administrative things that they need to do, to move children around, just mind-boggling. Um, and our goal and their goal, all of our goals, is to enable us to, to be educating our children as much in person as possible. And so when we talk about these mitigation efforts and these restrictions, you can look at it as a direct effort to help with our efforts to make sure that every child uh, gets the best, best education that they can and that we all chip in to make sure uh, that can happen. And all of us can do that by adjusting our, our holiday uh, plans, by keeping our Thanksgiving Celebration small and local, limit the number of households, keep your distance, uh, come up with ideas to have virtual Thanksgiving with our elderly family members, uh, uh, send grandma or mom or dad, uh, granddad uh, something uh, to their door, order it from your favorite restaurant and send it over. Uh, to grandma to, to give thanks uh, for everything that we all have. I'm, I know this is difficult and it's difficult for me as governor to have to decide to, to put these restrictions in place. I can tell you I, I wouldn't do it if I didn't think it was the right thing to do for the health and the economic welfare of our state, not just tomorrow, next week, uh, but next month uh, and next year. And, uh, you know, over the last nine months, we've seen what's happened. We've seen the run up in these cases. The public health officials warned us that this kind of a surge might occur as winter came upon us, more people moved indoors. And I was hoping and praying that that wasn't going to happen. But the numbers are very clear. We, we've seen them coming. And now we have to take action. We have to support those businesses who are restricted the most, and we will do that. Uh, and each of us can do that as well by ad ordering food 
uh, to be picked up uh, at the curbside, take out order by, by, by going to a restaurant and, and being one, part of that 30% uh, so that we can get uh, these important businesses uh, through this. And so that we can get our children back in school or keep them in school. Uh, and that's a big challenge. We've got a lot of educators who, who go to work every day to do that. We all want the same things there. And we just need to do what it takes to push down this spread, uh, get on the other side of this surge, get to a place where we have two vaccines that have proven pretty efficacious, uh, more than any of the scientists expected. They're not going to be here next week or next month or in, in the coming two or three months, I don't think. But uh, they will be here at some point, whenever that is. And, and we want to be uh, there uh, in better condition th than the direction that we're headed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carol Rote, who's going to talk a little bit more from a public health perspective about uh, this situation and give us an update. Thank you so much, Governor. So it is a tough day, and, and um, as the Governor said, I think we, we've all been hoping and praying that our, our uh, numbers would... Uh, would stay lower, um, but clearly we've seen uh, an acceleration of our cases, pretty rapid increase over the past few weeks, and um, and we all are concerned about the impact that that is going to have as, as we as we have seen our hospital numbers um, slowly increasing, and knowing that's a lagging indicator. When we look at where we've seen the increases. Um, you know, I've been using the same methodology now for a couple of months, and you know, there have been times when maybe we've had six to eight zip codes or so that meet those criteria, but now it's, it is um, much of the state that um, meets the same criteria that, that I have been looking at. Um, certainly in Sussex, we have some of our highest case rates still and highest percent positivity, so Sussex has been um, an area where we've got a, we've had a lot of case cases for quite a while, um, but really uh, Newcastle County has also seen significant increases. In fact, the, the fastest increases in case rates um, were in Newcastle County this this past week. Um, Bear, Middletown, Townsend area um, are some of our areas of highest concern. Newark as well. So we've continued to see cases among college age students, but also non-college age, age students as well. So um, significant increases in um, Newcastle County and um, in those areas. But also Kent County is one that has um, not had as much viral activity. We, we've also in general had our lowest testing rates in, uh, in Kent County, uh, but we've seen pretty significant increases in case rates and also the highest increases in hospital rates um, hospitalized rates in um, in Kent County, and as we, we talked about a bit before in in the in the past, hospitalization rates uh, can give can be a good indicator of how much community spread you have, especially in areas where um, people aren't getting tested as much. So, really, the bottom line of this slide is we're seeing um, a significant increase in cases throughout our state at this point in time. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the public health thinking and the science behind um, some of the actions that, uh, that the governor talked about today. So I first really want to focus on schools and you know, where the science is and in, in what we're seeing around schools. Um, as we've talked about from this summer, um, we do have concerns about the negative consequences of, of school closures for, for all children, but especially for uh, disadvantaged learners. And um, what we have observed, and I, I mentioned last week, we have five instances where we have seen in-school spread in Delaware, and we haven't seen any additional instances of in-school spread since last week, although the schools have been dealing with a lot of positive cases, 
those cases are infections brought in from the outside. So again, the, we're not seeing the spread inside the schools. And this is not just in Delaware. When, when we talk to the other, st the other states in our regional coalition, they're seeing the same experience. And um, European countries have, um, have now had quite a bit of, of experience while they've had you know, high rates of transmission in general and have closed a lot of things in their communities, they've been able to successfully keep schools open. Schools are safe because our educators and our staff are really doing a great job with the, putting these mitigation protocols in place. So they, they end up being very controlled environments for staff and the students. And so, you know, I mentioned this all today because, you know, as we're thinking about restrictions, we still want to do everything we can to keep schools open because they are so important. And hopefully, these other restrictions that we're putting in place will, will help us to be able to keep schools open. So on the next slide, I really wanted to, um, to touch on um, gatherings, but also um, how a super spreader event can, um, uh, can lead its tentacles into other spread in the community. And this is really a great depiction from Maine where they looked at a wedding. Um, a wedding that involved 55 people, um, no uh, or poor face covering and social distancing, so really limited mitigation, even though they had signage that said wear a mask, uh, masks weren't worn. And so out of the 55 people, there were 30 cases. And then these cases, um, you know, went back to their normal life after, after the wedding. So in a very small community, directly from this, this wedding, there were 27 cases and one death um, that were secondary spread, but then also secondary spread into a long-term care facility, which led to 38 cases and six deaths, and um, 200 miles away spread into a correctional facility that led to 82 cases. And um, we've seen a lot of examples similar in, in Delaware. So for example, uh, these are uh, top of mind today, just from you know, uh, uh, my review of all of our of our um, cluster data. Um, an individual um, who became infected, likely from a bar, who works at a long-term care facility. So um, that uh, may very well be how the spread was brought into a long-term care facility. Um, a restaurant where uh, we know that there was. Um, an event with uh, multiple people who became um, who became positive. Um, one of those individuals then works in a work site where 15 people became positive. Um, we have an example of multiple people attending a wedding that uh, work in um, a healthcare system, and so people became ill uh, f uh, from that spread. Additionally, um, uh, just uh, from the other day, a case of an individual who went to a funeral and um, uh, then brought uh, that case into um, or infection into a child care center. So it's it's easy to see when you when you think about it this way how some of these super spreader types of events or these gatherings then can uh, drive a lot more community spread and really really um, uh, really accelerate the spread. So on the next slide, um, I, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit more about some of what we're seeing in the, in the data. And I talked a little bit about this last week, but um, house parties um, are more common than, um, uh, than probably I, I expected. And um, not only are they common, but we've seen some house parties where we've had 30 or more people or more than 50% of people who attend these parties um, who become ill after house parties. I will say I'm really astonished at how many Halloween parties that um, took place in our state. And I do think that that is part of what really drove some of the acceleration that we're now seeing. And um, so it's not easy to um, imagine why now we're pretty fearful about what might happen with Thanksgiving gatherings, seeing kind of that surge after Halloween parties. 
Um, religious services we know are, are so incredibly important to people. Uh, we have seen 10 outbreaks related to res, uh, religious services, and a number of them involving more than 30 people. So again, um, spread can, can happen when people are in close proximity um, for an extended period of time, especially when, when um, uh, things like social distancing and, and face covering is not com uh, completely adhered to. Currently, right now, we're investigating uh, outbreaks related to four weddings, one funeral. Um, we have uh, examples of, of multiple, both uh, large and small, parties in restaurants. Um, so a small party could be two people or four people where um, multiple people then become ill from sitting at that table. But we also have several examples um, one in particular that I think is, is kind of eye-opening of a 12-person a party in a restaurant where now we know 10 of the 12 um, have, have become COVID positive. And if you think about it, it's a large table, right? So some of the people are going to be more than six feet apart. So again, you can see how sp um, spread uh, can happen beyond um, six feet in a in a close setting, and especially when people don't have face coverings. We talked a little last week as well about social gatherings in homes, small gatherings, like the governor was saying, football parties where people, you know, come together in a normal fall and just enjoy one another's company, you know, drinking beer, wine, and, and you know, eating pizza together. Um, it's, it's, it's not safe, and we're seeing spread this way, as well as um, birthday parties and, and other gatherings. So, you know, when we look at our data, these are some of the, the, the key concerns that we have and really the key drivers for the restrictions that, um, that the governor just went over. So I wanted to share a little bit of, of more concrete data that, that we have looking at our, uh, our events from our um, contact tracers. And um, it is really interesting that from August, about 18% of those cases, uh, of our cases, attended events or gatherings like house parties, religious services, or um, other large gatherings, or sports or restaurants. Not only did that increase significantly, so a lot more of our cases attended these kinds of gatherings, but the number of people at events increased significantly from 56 people in August to 86 people in October. So, you know, no doubt those are, you know, that's contributing to some of the acceleration in, in spread that, that we are seeing at this point in time. I wanted to mention um, restaurants. Um, restaurants um, are, are such a, a, a vital um, entity in our, our community. Um, I, I worked in restaurants for, for years um, and love our local restaurants. And so um, I think we all are, are concerned about uh, the impact on restaurants. But the, the reality is when you are sitting there indoors for an extended period of time, not socially distanced and having a mask off, it is, it is a very risky setting. And um, there is a, an abundant amount of science now uh, that is supporting restaurants at n not being safe in restaurants, being places where spread is taking place, including from our own data, some of which I just mentioned. But I also want to mention that it's not the fault of the restaurants. The restaurants are doing a lot of hard work around hygiene and keeping things clean, but the reality is it is spread from respiratory droplets, and um, it's pr it's it's hard to control that in a restaurant setting. And, and so um, I really just wanted to make mention, as the governor said, we, we truly acknowledge uh, the painful impact that this has on restaurants and the people who work there in the community and um, would not make this recommendation if it, if it were not important in decreasing the spread. So let me just uh, pivot quickly to talk about Thanksgiving and the holidays ahead, which I know the governor touched on, and, and we just really are concerned about um, the impact that social gatherings uh, related to Thanksgiving are going to have on our overall spread in Delaware um, and the impact of that spread, but, but also on the, the health of individuals, especially our most vulnerable populations. Um, we so strongly recommend that you only 
gather with those who live in your house this year. And we know that that's really, really hard to do, but that is our, our strong recommendation. Um, we also recommend that you do wear a face covering when you're in public or when you're around people you don't live with. So for example, if you do have somebody visiting your home normally, it's very awkward to think about wearing a mask if somebody's in, in your home, right? But um, we strongly recommend that if you do have somebody come over to visit or likewise, you keep a mask on at all times, um, stay six feet away, go, uh, be outside as much as possible. And that leads me to two other important points. College students and other young adults are returning home for the holidays, which is great, right? But there's also a risk that we're going to get a lot of spread uh, from, um, from these folks coming into the homes of um, their families. And so the recommendations that our col colleges here in our state and regionally are making is that um, students and young adults should be quarantining um, ideally two weeks before they go home. They really should all get tested before they go home. And uh, when they arrive home, wear a mask when they're arriving or when they're around others. Ideally, get tested several days after getting home. And although we know young adults love to be around their high school friends, to have high school reunions, this is just not the year to do this in person. So we hope that parents, you'll, you'll help support this as well, which, again, we know is very difficult. Black Friday and a lot of shopping is coming up. Um, we really want people to think about how to shop safely this year. Avoid crowds, avoid being in stores during the busy seasons, just be patient. Um, please go to your local, uh, uh, local favorite shops, but um, um, also look at opportunities to, uh, to shop online and, and just do things differently this year. And finally, I just wanna wrap up um, with a focus on, on wearing a mask. Um, this is the most important guidance that I can give to all Delawareans right now is please, please wear a mask when you are around anybody who is not a member of your um, immediate normal household. Uh, it is the most important thing you can do to help us decrease the spread of this virus. And with that, I'm going to hand it back to the governor. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rattay, uh, for getting into uh, what we've learned over the last uh, nine months uh, and what we've heard from contact tracing and from folks who have uh, tested positive. Uh, we saved uh, the good news, the positive message for you, AJ. Uh, you and your team deserve it uh, with the tremendous uh, effort you're doing to make sure everybody uh, who should get tested and needs to get tested in Delaware is, is getting that test. So you were on. So thank you, sir. Um, so I, I think the... the Governor kind of hit the high point. I mean, testing has been very successful this month so far. We're at 58,000 as of uh, the 14th. I'll tell you, this is uh, due to partnerships across the state. Our National Guard partners have been uh, kind of the foundation since the beginning. Newcastle County has definitely done their fair share and then some to assist with uh, multiple sites a week up in uh, Newcastle County. Uh, the public health clinics that we turned on a few months ago to help with uh, staffing and having that consistent site have uh, done, you know, they keep on doing more people every week, so we see, we're glad to see that people trust that. Um, you know, the, the staff at DEMA, Walgreens, the school locations, the, you know, partners at Frawley Stadium or other events where we do this really has been a, a community effort, so we appreciate everybody's work with that. Uh, so 58,000 to date, as you see, a, a little bit more last week than the week before, and we expect that number to continue to go up. Um, next week, we, we know there's Thanksgiving. We know there's going to be um, students coming home, as Dr. Rattay uh, alluded to, we'll be working with, uh, you know, the universities, uh, uh, Wesley, Dell State, University of Delaware, to allow and provide opportunities for individuals to get tested this week. Um, we've also put to out kind of our Monday and Tuesday and uh, some of the Wednesday events for next week, knowing that there might be students getting back. So if they're doing that self-quarantine, they could uh, hopefully get that second test. Uh, Monday, um, we will be at uh, three locations from 8 to 8. We'll be at uh, both the Dell Tech campuses in Dover and Georgetown from 8 to 8 with the Curative Trailer. We'll be at the Epworth Church in Rehoboth from uh, 8 to 8 as well. So a little longer day because we know it's a busy time of the year and we want to make sure you get as many people um, fit in. Uh, Newcastle County is going to be at Frawley Stadium 2 to 7. Uh, 
on Monday. They're going to be at Seeds of Greatness uh, Tuesday, uh, Middletown High School Wednesday. There's a few other walk-ups they have there at, um, I, I believe, uh, Garfield Park. And one other that will be uh, all up on the curative site tomorrow to sign up to. So even though next week's going to be busy, we want to you know make sure we still get people tested and have those opportunities. We'll also be uh, returning to some events on Friday. So Thursday will be off. Friday, Saturday, we'll have events as well that will be published uh, later on uh, this week. Um, Lastly, I think uh, an exciting announcement that came out from Public Health, Dr. Tay and Dr. Pescator have worked a long time on antigen testing. Uh, we received rapid tests from our, our federal partners. We received, uh, Dr. Pescator has worked on a program to roll out um, you know, additional antigen testing to locations throughout the state. They've worked with Numores, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and, and really pediatric providers across the state to make sure that there is rapid tests available for children and adolescents in the state. Uh, this will support the, you know, all the work that's being done by public health and the governor's office and all the schools and teachers to make sure that the children uh, stay safe and have the uh, access they need to testing in addition to the community sites. So a uh, short update today, but uh, all the uh, testing sites can be found at de.gov slash get tested. And uh, we had the ones for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday confirmed. They'll be live tomorrow. And then uh, Fridays and Saturdays will be uh, confirmed probably closer to the end of the week. So, sir, that's it. Yeah, so that uh, last uh, point about the rapid testing uh, for Delaware children and adolescents statewide is, is an important one, particularly with respect to uh, our support for, for schools and school districts and, and teachers because uh, you know part of the problem that uh, they're encountering that we've learned in our conversations with teachers is once somebody tests positive outside of, of school, uh, individuals who may or may not have come in contact with that uh, positive tested person has to have to quarantine. And so the faster we can get the result about whether they're positive or not, the faster that they, the child can come back in. The, uh, the professional can, can get back to work, and that helps operationally. Uh, that's, I think, the biggest challenge that we're hearing uh, from teachers mostly, but also from uh, our district superintendents. So that's a, an important uh, use of that. The other thing that I would encourage people to do, again, is to download the COVID Alert DE app. Uh, we've got, I think, around 16,000 folks that are, are signed up. It is anonymous. It does, uh, uh, I think, effectively give you a tool uh, in the toolbox to know whether you've come in contact with somebody who, uh, who may have tested, uh, who has tested positive and who is also using the app. So with that, we have a number of pre-submitted uh, questions. We also have media in the room, and we would invite them forward to answer questions first. Thank you for, for coming um, and for joining us today. All right, Governor, uh, how are you today? Good? I've had better days. I'm unfortunate. I can understand. Um, you know, I have to ask here, how are you going to practically enforce the indoor uh, at-home gathering limits, especially given that you guys just discussed the fact that people have been gathering for at least a couple months now, it sounds like, and they haven't really been, I guess, listening to the warnings about what's going to happen uh, you know, if you have these events. Yeah, we rely primarily uh, on most of this on, uh, on voluntary uh, compliance. Um, there are certain things that we do with, with uh, public uh, establishments, uh, with uh, public health enforcement, uh, with law enforcement, uh, but we're not going to be knocking on people's doors to see how many uh, are at dinner for Thanksgiving. I wanted to ask you about the restrictions on religious, uh, I guess, locations that was mentioned in the release. You guys just had a settlement, as I understand. Um, how's that going to mesh? Because it sounds like you could potentially run into issues there. Uh, no, the the agreement in the settlement was to treat, uh, not treat uh, religious uh, venues uh, differently than others, and this does not. Okay. Um, I, I got to ask you about moratoriums on on evictions and foreclosures. That was something I believe we saw earlier in the year, uh, and I, I think that came down as part of an executive order. But we're starting to see restrictions come back under what you announced today. Some people's employment may end up getting affected by this. 
Um, are you looking into bringing any of those things back? Yeah, it's something we're going to have to take a look at, Tom. It's not something that has been top of mind. Uh, we've really been focused on how we can strike the balance uh, that enables us to push down the spread um, and to contain the spread while allowing uh, economic uh, activity. And uh, that's something, obviously, as, as you uh, rightly point out, we're going to have to take a look at again. And lastly, this is kind of for Carol and AJ. Uh, the teachers union recently uh, reached out to the governor's office writing a letter talking about concerns they've had from teachers. One of the things they brought up was that teachers are buying their own PPE from what they've said. And my question to you is, um, can you talk about what role the state may have had in distributing PPE to these uh, locations and, and whether that seems like something that should be happening given uh, you know, what efforts may have already happened? Well, let me take a first shot at it. Sure. Uh, first of all, we ought to be uh, trying to help there, and in any way we can. I did see that a communication. We had recently met with uh, the, uh, the DSEA and have been on a regular basis as well as talking to teachers in indiv individual districts, and this was one of the things that uh, they've been asking us to, to be more, more actively involved in decision making. I still maintain that decision making ought to be at the level where people know operationally, you know, what they can and can do, cannot do. Uh, we are trying as hard as we can to give the best public health advice about what's safe. I was just on a uh, conference call the other day with regional governors, Governor Cuomo, uh, Governor Murphy, Governor Wolf, and, um, and what everybody was saying was similar, that they weren't seeing a lot of transmission within the school setting itself. Uh, and so the, the issue gets to be mitigation outside of that setting, as, as was pointed out in the, in the communication from the teachers that affects the, the school, right? And so that's kind of what we're trying to get uh, at here, and that's our message to Delawareans if, is, you know, if we want children in schools, and we, everybody does, every, doesn't matter who you talk to, then we've got to take these measures to prevent and push down the potential for exposure there. Uh, with respect to a PPE or others, that's you know something that we're willing to to lean into. What whatever it takes, I think, is 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 our approach. AJ, the only thing I'll, I'll add is uh, we did push out packages uh, to every school in the beginning, uh, probably late summer. You know, pr prior to them going back to uh, any type of hybrid environment. Uh, as the governor said, we are going to continue to see what type of support we can provide them, um, whether that's you know kind of see where those gaps are now and. Uh, see how we could uh, meet in the middle somewhere and uh, help link them to a solution. Just lastly, Governor, have you had any conversations with Governor Hogan about uh, restrictions? I have had conversations with Governor Hogan uh, about uh, our conversations around higher ed uh, with respect to students coming or going uh, from our respective states back home getting tested, whether or not, and we've been having uh, conver conversations with our individual higher ed decision makers, right? Turns out Delaware's, uh, Del UD, Dell State, Wesley have all been in line with what we've been talking about, getting tested, uh, students getting tested before they go home, quarantining, I think Dr. Rattay talked a little bit about this, and then not returning until spring semester, which is the case here, I think, in every, in every instance. Um, and just, just talking to Dr. Hogan, uh, I'm sorry, Governor Hogan about being, about being part of that. Specific uh, restrictions um, in a general sense came up in that conversation, but nothing specifically, no. Okay, thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, that ought to be clear with respect to PPE, we ought to be providing the teachers with the necessary PPE. Uh, Jake Owen, Seller Business Times, uh, probably both for Governor Carney and Dr. Rattay. Uh, Dr. Rattay, you've uh, um, just reiterated pretty forcefully here that the transmission risk is higher at restaurants just by the nature of the fact we have to take our mask off to eat. 
If that is the case, why have we not gone to the level uh, that, say, Philadelphia did with shutting down indoor dining, but we're still allowing 30 percent capacity? Yeah, maybe I should take that and then <laughs> hand it off and you can help. Uh, it goes back to that fundamental uh, uh, objective uh, of trying to strike the right balance, right? I've been saying this till I'm red in the face, and I get red in the face fairly easily, is to to, to balance out, you, can't, you have to have a healthy community and a healthy economy, right? And it can't be an either or proposition. And so we're trying to strike that balance with respect to restrictions that are targeted. Uh, it, it, it would be the worst possible thing to just impose restrictions just because another state is doing it or we think it might work, when we have evidence. Uh, that this is where spread is occurring and that limiting exposure is what uh, prevents the spread. And I'll let Dr. Rote uh, maybe comment on whatever uh, about that she'd like. Yeah, um, so I mean, as I expressed, we do know that there is certainly risk in, in restaurants. Um, uh, the health officials had a conversation with uh, with Dr. Burks last week, and she was talking about some of the analyses that they did in, in Texas and California and Florida in regards to restaurants. And um, obviously, you know, she expressed concerns about spread in restaurants and bars as well. Um, but her um, strong guidance from the, those observations and those analyses were you got to decrease the number of people in these settings. If you can decrease the number of people in the settings, you can decrease the amount of virus and decrease the spread. And so, as the governor said, we really want these places to stay open as much as possible. So this is the approach that, that we're taking, and, and we hope that it works. One of the things that we've been doing some analysis here the last couple of days of the statistics, like I'm sure we all have. Um, one of the things that was interesting to, to us, though, was that it's not just one demographic group. Whether you look at 18 to 34, 35 to, to 60 and on up, uh, 50 to 64, almost all age groups are up 50% or more in the last couple months. Uh, is there anything different you can say to try to kind of drive home this point, or is there a feeling it's falling on deaf ears? Well, one of the things is it's all of us, right? I mean, there was a time, and I've got up on the board current hospitalizations uh, going all the way back to the beginning just to show the shape of things, right? And, and there, there's questions about there, what, how, how do you know it works? There's how you know. Because we put restrictions in place. We started, you know, stay at home much more dramatic than what we're doing now. And we, we pushed that curve way down. You can see the little bump up there as we got into September after Labor Day and then after October, you know, continue. We've got to push that right down right now. We don't have shut down. We don't have as many uh, tools right now to use, uh, frankly. And that's why messaging is, uh, is so critically important. But the, the, what it tells us is that we're all in this. It's not just the young adult crowd as, as it was. Uh, you know, when we got to uh, into the summertime, it's not just the beach a crowd, young adult crowd again uh, there uh, after Fourth of July. It's as you said, every age group. It's really now, other than Kent County, it's every kind of corner of the state, uh, uh, frankly. And um, so the message has to be the same to, to, to all of us. And just lastly, uh, obviously back in the summer, Governor, you convened a pandemic resurgence advisory committee to try to plan for exactly this kind of a moment. I'm wondering what lessons, if anything, you were able to, to find from their determinations. Yeah, well, one of the, one of the things uh, that they re recommended strong, two things that they recommended strongly, one we, I would argue we were already doing was excessive amounts of communication, right? Uh, keeping everybody alert and up, uh, give people time to react. I've been saying for two or three weeks now that this is what we're seeing. Not saying that this restriction or that was going to occur, but read between the lines. You know, you, you can just see we were going to have to do something. Um, I would have liked to give more time between this announcement today and 
the following Monday, which is um, uh, when these go into effect for, for restaurants, just because people need time to plan. I get, get all that. That was a big recommendation. Unfortunately, it, 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 it hit fast and grew fast. And we tried to, I think it was, um, you know, uh, hope, hope over experience that maybe we could, it, this wasn't going to happen, uh, but it's, it's happening. Uh, it's going to happen. Other states, yeah, we're not other states. We're, we're better. We're doing better. And we still are to a certain extent, but we're in with everybody else. I think because of the, the nature of the world and social environments as you move from summer to fall to winter and you move indoors, and everything that I've heard from public health folks over the last uh, nine months is indoors and outdoors is way different, and we're seeing that. Obviously, we're focused on Thanksgiving, Black Friday, some of these impending holidays. Is there a feeling that we're likely going to be under these same restrictions come Christmas and New Year's? Boy, I hope not. I don't want to be under them a day more than we have to. And I'd like to see the next set of bars uh, going straight out flat from there. I think my experience of the last nine months suggests that's not going to be the case. This is hospitalizations. We know it's a lagging indicator. Uh, I'd at least like to see positive cases flatline from here. Um, and then we can be in a better place. But it's not going to happen unless we take it seriously. We, we, you know, people get tired of it. I get it. They get complacent. Although I do see a, a lot of people wearing masks kind of all the time. And that's a good thing. How are you, Governor? Hi, Sarah. Uh, do these indoor gathering restrictions apply to homeless shelters? And what is the state going to do in handling homeless shelters this winter with social distancing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know that we've thought a lot about it. I can tell you uh, we will. And if you remember back, uh, the lieutenant governor and community activists that had been working on um, overdose uh, and heroin, uh, people who were addicted to heroin issues, converted their uh, group into an outreach for homeless folks. And we made available hotels that were shut down uh, so that they could get off the streets in safer environments. Those hotels, we're not shutting the hotels down now. So we don't have those spaces. And so it's a, it's a very different environment that we'll have to, to look at uh, for just the things that you're asking about. So I don't have a good answer for you. Um, a huge concern this winter is, um, you know, this, this, you know, unfortunate side effect of shutdowns, which is people's mental health, yeah. which is already a concern in the summer. Now we're in a place where weather is not going to allow people to gather outdoors, which as you mentioned, can be safer than gathering indoors. My point is there's, you know, there's an increased concern for something that people are already concerned about, which is a, a rise in suicide rates, et cetera, um, as long as this shutdown continues during the winter. Do you have a message for people who have let, those concerns? Yeah, let me go back to the first question, because I don't think I answered your question, which sure. is, no, those restrictions do not apply to where people live. Okay. Think about where I lived as a kid. There were 11 of us in that small house, nine, nine kids and my mom and dad. <laughs> we couldn't have kept appropriate social distancing under, under those kinds of restrictions. Where people live is not subject to that. So to your second question, which was? People's mental health. Do you have a message for people who are concerned about mental health being very negatively impacted um, during this pandemic? Yeah, no, I, it's one of the things that's uppermost in, in our minds. And it's why, going back to the question about why are we conceding, if you were allowing a, a, any kind of, a, of activity in certain business establishments, part of that on the business side is so that they can get some revenue and hopefully survive it and get to the other side. All the we work so hard on youth sports activity because it's such a lift to uh, our young people's kind of mental health and positive attitude. Being in school is hugely important 
for our children, actually for our, our parents and, and teachers and everybody. Uh, it's terrible, and, and all the all the the research and everything we've heard is how negatively that effect is. And so, we want to try to balance all those things out and think about the impact of of people when we restrict activity in one way or the other. We don't have stay-at-home orders, right? We are saying, look, we have to accept a, a new normal for some time being uh, and encourage people to do that and be as positive we can, as we can in the messaging and, and all the rest and in the result. Um, the result is there are more things that you can do that are positive for your mental health and your well-being. They also bring with it a certain amount of risk in terms of exposure, um, even on a, on a limited basis. But if you're able to go and, uh, and your, your child's able to go to, to school for you know, maybe a couple of days a week and is able to be involved in this activity, that's way better than sitting at home all the time um, and not having that interaction. And so it's, it's a way of trying to find a way that, uh, that we can live and, and be reasonably happy and satisfied with the restrictions that we've put on our place. I, I, I'm amazed. I, I was driving to work today, and a school bus passed me. And I could see through the window all the little, little guys in there. And they all had face masks on. The little guys, they kind of adapt you know, even better than we do, right? Um, and I think that's a lot of, of what we're trying to deal with is uh, adaptation, acceptance, compliance uh, as, a, as a way of, of uh, achieving the, the public health objective. Dr. Rattay, you know more about mental health than I do. Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an incredibly stressful time for, for so many people and especially um, uh, people who are struggling with um, whether it's um, occupational or um, income or um, previous mental health or substance abuse issues. Um, wanted to make sure that um, I did mention that as of yesterday, we uh, um, added a new addition onto our COVID website, which is the How Right Now campaign, which is um, provides guidance and resources to support people with um, who, who need to address or want to address, whether it's so, social isolation or mental health challenges right now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. All right, seeing nobody else here in person, we have some pre-submitted uh, questions. All right, first question is from Nick Cialino at Delaware Public Media. Is there concern COVID restrictions do more harm than good? What in the data suggests restrictions in Delaware have been effective enough at stopping the spread of the virus to outweigh the obvious downsides? Yeah, I think I, I, I addressed that to a certain extent already, is that, uh, that we are worried that restrictions may uh, impose uh, damage that's, uh, that's really bad and, and maybe not worth it. We have experience that tells us that it works. And, that's why we have this graph uh, that hopefully people are seeing that shows the effectiveness of the mitigation efforts that we took after the spike up in cases. And this is hospitalizations. And you can see the peak there in late April. And then as we push the, uh, flatten the curve, clearly flattens through the summer. And now it's ticking up a little bit as we move into this surge. And so that that is just, it's just empirical evidence. That's just evidence that those measures work. The other part of the question is, is was it worth it? We try to just strike the balance to get this kind of effect with a, as low a cost as possible. And that's a challenging thing to do. The next question is from Johnny Braxton at 6ABC. What is the status of hospital bed space? Will additional emergency space set up earlier in the year be needed? Yeah, so I think uh, I addressed that a little bit. I think we're somewhere between 400 and 500, I guess, depending on the day, uh, somewhere over 400 uh, in terms of uh, available capacity there. I think our ventilator number is about the same. We did get some additional ventilators rehabbed, uh, CJ's 
or AJ's uh, shaking his head. Um, and we're up to 153 hospitalizations at the moment. They're not all on ventilators. Um, and so you know, one of the differences right now is that hospitals are doing, uh, they have more people in these critical care uh, circumstances with elective surgeries. Uh, they're not, uh, they haven't stopped those as they did in spring. Uh, we do not have at the moment uh, a reserve hospital set up. I don't know, AJ, how long it would take us to do that. We have, uh, you know, we still have the agreement with uh, New Moors. They gave us one of their wings, so we, we could turn that on. But I think the other, the other factor that I think is going to be limiting us before actual bed space will be uh, staffing for for a hospital and critical care individuals. So it's a uh, we have to look at the health of the overall uh, medical uh, field, not just the number of beds we have available in any one place. Yeah, AJ makes a very good point. In fact, probably the limiting factor right now is staff at the hospitals. Uh, they've lost considerable revenue, and so they've, they've got to run as tightly as they can at the moment as well. They've done an amazing job uh, doing most of the testing back in the spring and being a great partner all the way through. We have a regular conference call with them. They keep us up to date on the critical nature of the patients that they have in their emergency rooms and in their critical care units. And so, uh, um, but it's different. Uh, it is different now than it was then. This is the last question we have time for. We got a few questions asking how much did the new restrictions in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey influence any changes in Delaware? Yeah, I don't know that they influenced the changes in terms of restrictions other than uh, being an indication that the level of spread was serious and not just localized here in Delaware. In fact, it's worse in southeastern Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, uh, New Jersey. Not completely clear if, uh, the difference between South Jersey and, and North Jersey the last time around. South Jersey was much better off than the nor more densely populated northern part of the state. But when we see numbers like we saw in New Jersey, New York, uh, New England, even Vermont, New Hampshire, very remote populations, very uh, low density populations, um, and uh, we saw the kinds of surges in Maryland and Metro DC, we knew that uh, that was going to be challenging for us as well because we have so many people that go across the border, uh, family, friends, and work, and traveling up and down across the border. The virus sees no borders in that respect. Um, but in terms of specific restrictions, you know, we looked really to the Delaware experience, the numbers here, uh, our targeted areas uh, as identified uh, by our contact tracers, and the public health officials based on what we're seeing in other places as well. Uh, and then uh, obviously communications among the governors about uh, whether there were things that we could do uh, in common, like uh, our approach to students leaving colleges and universities for Thanksgiving. So I think that's uh, all the questions that we have today. Uh, let me just end by encouraging everybody to get your flu uh, shot, your flu vaccine. Again, incredibly important, particularly as we move further into flu season and as we see more hospitalizations uh, as a result of the flu and as a result of COVID-19. I'm convinced uh, that we can do it here in Delaware. We've done it before. We can flatten this curve. We can beat this virus. We're going to beat this virus. Uh, there are going to be sacrifices that, that we have to, ma be, uh, to make. Uh, some will sacrifice more than others. That's why we're really reaching out to help our, hosp our uh, hospitality and, and restaurant industry with a, another CARES Act uh, program and, and, and financing there. I know that it'll take more than that. And so remember to, uh, to get takeout at your favorite restaurant to help them uh, along the way. And we can all help. Uh, by doing our part to push down the spread of the virus so that we don't have to live under these restrictions for more than uh, the one day, more than, than what is necessary. Uh, so with that, thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.